Welcome, everybody. My name is Margot Smith. I'm director of Kluge Rue Aboriginal Art Collection. Welcome to the Beyond Dreaming Symposium on behalf of Kluge Rue and our partners in this endeavor, the Institute for Global Humanities and Cultures, the Embassy of Australia, and the Vice Provost for the Arts. I invite you to join me in acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land we're on today, the Monacan people, and paying respects to their elders past, present, and future. It's my pleasure to introduce Jody Kilbasa, Vice Provost of the Arts, a true champion for the arts at UVA. Please help me welcome him. Thank you, Margo, uh, and hello, everyone. The arts are thriving at the University of Virginia, especially the indigenous arts of Australia and the Americas, in no small part due to Kluge Rue director Margo Smith and curator Henry Skerritt's great work, along with our university's unique partnership with the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Museums play a central role in introducing students to people, cultures, and ideas that they might not encounter otherwise. For the past 20 years, Kluge Rue has brought indigenous artists and scholars, curators, and knowledge holders to the university to share their experience and expertise with students and our greater community here in Charlottesville. Working with our many partners, the Kluge Roo has generated truly amazing projects, student curated exhibitions like Beyond Dreamings, The Rise of Indigenous Australian Art in the United States, collaborative arts projects with leading artists like Judy Watson's Experimental Beds, student research at indigenous run art centers in Australia, such as that conducted by third year Callie Collins last summer at Millingimby, this symposium, which has drawn a national and international audience, is evidence of the far-reaching impact that a focused museum, like the Kluge Roo Collection, has in cultivating global recognition and appreciation of indigenous Australian art, and UVA is very proud to serve as host. One last thing I want to share with you. It is a dream of mine that in the very near future, the Kluge Roo and the Fralin will be separate institutions under one roof with shared resources. So I welcome all of you in helping me realize that dream in the future. And with that, I'd like to welcome Margo back to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. I share that dream. Um, in 19... 88, the exhibition Dreamings, the Art of Aboriginal Australia at the Asia Society Galleries in New York catapulted Indigenous Australian art onto the world stage. Dreamings was the first major introduction of Aboriginal art to American audiences and represented a turning point in its international reception. Anthropologist Fred Myers describes it as the moment when Aboriginal art emphatically became fine art. Dreamings also signaled a radical shift in the way indigenous artists and communities were represented in the modern museum. This symposium celebrates three decades since Dreamings, reconsidering its historical moment and examining its legacies. We're so grateful to all the participants who have taken time from their busy lives to join us for a few days of lively conversation about Aboriginal art. The symposium grew out of an exhibition at the Kluge Roo Collection curated by nine graduate students as part of a course last spring taught by Kluge Roo curator Henry F. Skerritt. They are Lucia Columbari, Cecilia Gunsberger, Eliza Hodgson, Audrey Lee, Clara Ma, Eleanor Newman, Kelvin Parnell Jr., Lauren Van Nest, and Megan Walsh. When you join us at the Kluge Roo, for the reception tomorrow night or the program on Saturday morning, you'll see the result of their efforts at the exhibition Beyond Dreamings, The Rise of Indigenous Australian Art in the United States. And that's on display until July 7th, so there's ample time to come back and savor it at a later time. There are many people to acknowledge and thank for contributing both to the Beyond Dreamings exhibition and to this symposium. Lenders to the exhibition include Greg Castillo, who's here with us, John and Barbara Wilkerson, and the Wolfenson Family Foundation. Sponsors at UVA are the Institute for Global Humanities and Cultures, the McIntyre Department of Art, the Office of Graduate and Postdoctoral Affairs, particularly Deans Ed Barnaby and Philip Trella, 
and the Vice Provost for the Arts. We're exceedingly grateful to our outside sponsors, the Embassy of Australia, and Man and Greta Arts and Culture for their contributions as well. We're particularly indebted to our symposium speakers, oh, Balang John Monjal, OAM, John Mundine, OAM, Chris Anderson, John Carty, Francois Dussart, Marie Gard, Eleanor Newman, Maya Nuku, Terry Smith, and Peter Sutton for taking time from their busy lives to share their knowledge and experience with us. Some of these notable people through their involvement with the Dreamings exhibition set the foundation for Aboriginal Australian art in the United States and are by extension responsible for the very existence of the Kluge Roo collection. Others are leading academic and curatorial vo voices um, for global contemporary indigenous art today. Several of them advised Henry's students in the curation of Beyond Dreamings, and they've been outstanding colleagues and friends to the Kluge Roo collection in numerous ways over the past 20 years. At this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Karen Wood, an enrolled member of the Monacan Indian Nation and director of Virginia Indian programs at Virginia Humanities. Karen holds an MFA in poetry and a PhD in linguistic anthropology from UVA. She's worked at the National Museum of the American Indian as a researcher and at the Association on American Indian Affairs as a repatriation specialist. In 2015, she was honored as one of Virginia's women in history. Karen is a Mellon Indigenous Arts Initiative faculty fellow and the author of two poetry collections, Markings on Earth, which was published in 2000, and Weaving the Boundary, which was published in 2016. So please help me welcome Dr. Karen Wood. Thank you, Margo, and thank you all for coming out this evening. Um, my role tonight is to welcome you as a member of the homeland tribe, the Monacan people, whose existence has been here for thousands of years, and to bring you into our circle of community to say thank you for coming all this way to share your knowledge with us. And so first, I'd like to offer a prayer to do that by telling you what I'm going to say in English, and then I'll say it in my language, which is to say we bring everybody's mind into a good place uh, together, into a kind and healing space. We forget all of the troubles that we have. We leave them outside the door. You can pick them up on your way out if you would like. Um, but in the meantime, I want you to speak to our creator and say, Kigun e kia. So I want to Masikambi, Tosne Nahambe, Mikewa Ainkwa Kasi, and Nenu Yesa, Monkey Kua Yukan Yotsa, Eoma Bitoka, Helen and Hes, Kawaya Konspewa Nansai, Ika Amai Inyoma, the Posse Ain, Ika Amai Konspewa Gedaya. And what I'm also doing is acknowledging, in addition to our relationships to one another, our relationships to the beings around us, the geographic formations, the mountains we call our grandmothers. You know, this is our home place, our very special place. And for us, it is not a place to extract resources. It is a place of reciprocity where we come together to give back. So I hope that that's what you'll be able to do during this symposium. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, that was beautiful. So tonight's program is a conversation with curator John Mundine. John is a Banjalung man born in 1951 in Grafton, New South Wales. OAM, which is at the end of his name, is, uh, oops, sorry, forward my side. Um, OAM is a recognition from the Australian government for his extraordinary achievements. It's the Medal of the Order of Australia. But I recall uh, John used to say it stands for Old Aboriginal Man. <laughs> John is someone who is um, 
a kind of an icon in the field of Aboriginal art. He worked as art center manager at Mill and Gimby beginning in 1979 and went on to be the art center manager at Raman Ginning uh, for more than a decade. He's best known for working collaboratively with indigenous artists on many major collections for institutions and for collectors. Uh, in, most notably the Aboriginal Memorial, which many of you have seen in person at the, um, the National Gallery of Art uh, in Canberra, a 1988 installation that we'll talk about a little bit later, but also Native Born, a collection of 200 paintings for the Power Institute, and that was put together in 1983, and the Kluge Collection beginning in 1989. Tonight, in addition to talking about these accomplishments, we'll learn about some of John's more recent projects, working with communities and descendants on collaborative um, programs, exploring their family and history, with groups of, and working with groups of artists orchestrating performance artworks. John has always operated on the cutting edge of Indigenous Australian art. He's a prolific writer and carries much of the history of the movement in his very sharp memory. He's a cultural icon in the Aboriginal art world, and we're delighted he's here tonight. Please help me welcome John Mundine. Just turn your mic on. Yeah, I think that's all. Hello. Hello. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> I'm kicking the bottle again. <laughs> and what I didn't say is John and I have known each other since 1996, so almost my whole career working with Aboriginal art. Um, so the way that we're going to do this is I'm going to ask him some questions, and then he's going he's gonna to talk. And uh, we'll try and steer it in a direction that roughly matches the slides. <laughs> But yes. <laughs> may or may not happen that yes. way. It won't be about my war injuries. And <laughs> OK, so um, this first slide shows John in 1980 uh, up in Arnhem Land. And I wanted to first ask, what was the state of Aboriginal art in Australia when you first started working in remote communities, in remote community art centers? Well, thank you. Uh, thanks for the warm welcome, and thank to Karen Woods uh, mm -hmm. for that uh, welcome to country. Uh, that was really great. That's the, one of the first times uh, I've had that from a Native American person. So that's really good that that was organized. Thank you. Uh, the state, um, uh, this, all these photos, as you get older, people pull these photos out. Some people keep trying to. Uh, to blackmail you or something. Um, uh, when I came uh, to work in uh, the field of Aboriginal art formally, because I was, a, was involved in Aboriginal art and cultural practice or cultural thinking uh, from the day I was born, in fact. So the Bunjalung people, um, I was born into a family, the Bunjalung people of northern New South Wales, a very large group, very well recorded. They're, our language is written down in English and taught uh, at the university there for quite some time. Uh, it's a very um, well-known Aboriginal group. So when I, I actually came to work in Aboriginal art um, in a commercial sense or in an academic sense, like all of you are here for, I gather, uh, that. Uh, about the mid-70s. Uh, the government of that time had uh, set up a company uh, to, um, to market Aboriginal art so that it wasn't being sold as tourist art for sixpence or whatever it is, for a dime or a nickel. They, it was sold to bring it into the Australian art, fine art world, and then by that into the uh, world of fine art uh, creation that were worldwide. And that was their brief um, to do that. And I came there, and it was like one of those comedy things where somebody gave me a hat and a, a desk and a sign that said, You're, we'll make you our operations manager. 
and uh, so like that, like someone from the Wizard of Oz giving me, it will put a medal on you or a name. Of course, what it meant was I was the storeman and packer. So I used to pack every, all the artwork up um, and wrap it up and make sure it was taken away by truck or plane or whatever. And that's really how I came to work there. Now, the position I took up, just quickly, the posi position I took up in Millingimby uh, it's called an art and craft advisor in those days. And uh, that uh, position was normally uh, held uh, on these Christian missions, which largely these communities were Christian missions, uh, that they, uh, one of the missionaries on that mission would actually market the uh, art paintings and so on that were made by the Aboriginal people. Uh, those uh, churches w would be given an, an amount of money to uh, feed, so to speak, to feed all the people that were on their mission or to or go, go towards feeding the people that were on their mission and looking after them. Uh, that um, uh, any other money they could raise, uh, any artist or local Aboriginal person who could paint or weave a, a mat or a basket etc., that would be extra money that they could then uh, buy things from the uh, store at that mission. And so this particular peculiar painting, uh, photo, uh, somebody sent me from, uh, who was at Millingimby in 1980, 81, uh, David Ritchie actually, uh, the uh, head of the uh, Sacred Sites Authority in Darwin now, uh, his wife was a teacher there. But we received a funny uh, letter from a French naval museum in La Havre. Is it? Excuse my French. Uh, and uh, they uh, wanted to buy a bark canoe. And uh, so we talked to a number of people, but the people in Cape Stewart near us, they uh, went about it and made this bark canoe. And we picked that up uh, from Cape Stewart, which was to the west of Millingimby. Uh, Millingimby is an island in a number of islands that are still known called the Crocodile Islands because, as you know, the, the whole place is full of crocodiles. Um, so um, uh, we went over there to pick that up and bring it back. And uh, it had never actually been put in the water, so we uh, brought it back and put it in the water there just to test it uh, before we sent it off to, uh, to this, uh, in this weird way, to France. Um, so, um, but anyway, the, these uh, positions, uh, when uh, in the 70s, the Whitlam government um, uh, began a program called uh, Self-Determination, and they, what happened was that local councils were set up within these Aboriginal uh, villages and societies to run the mission rather than the missionaries running it. And that was a big step. And when they did that, they formalised the position in the early 70s of being an art and craft advisor. It became a paid position then instead of... Um, a missionary just doing this in their spare time, so to speak. And so from Millingimby, you went to Raman Ginning, um, and this is, the, this is the first arts and crafts building at Raman Ginning in this slide. Yes, that's um, right, luxurious it was. Yeah. call it a donga. <laughs> um, and so you have written about different phases in Aboriginal art, um, kind of different different periods. And just now you've talked about a couple when when missions when missionaries were kind of intermediaries between artists and the um, the public that was buying the artworks. And then the arts and crafts um, company that was started by the government. And but when you started working in Ramen Ginning, there was you know some of the things that you managed to do really kind of brought Aboriginal art into more of a national spotlight um, through programs like Perspecta. And so I was just curious about, you want, do you want to go through those six phases very briefly? Well, the six phases, somewhere I wrote down, but other people have said this before, 
and publish this uh, somewhere else too, but I said there were six, my, it's a personal view of the six phases in the history of Aboriginal art. And it's basically how the Australian population, the non-Aboriginal Australian population reacted to uh, Aboriginal art and Aboriginal people. So you have a, um, uh, in fact, when the British arrived in Australia, there are at least about 250 different language groups uh, across the country, there were 250 different societies uh, living in different geographical uh, environments across the country and carry on a, a cultural practice, an art practice uh, as well that was different. So I came to the thing uh, to draw up my six phases of Aboriginal art and they were the first phases from the beginning of time when Aboriginal people were, were on the continent of Australia, that that's the creation of the world, so to speak, which is something 60, 70,000 years before the present, um, up until about the uh, end of the night, Second World War. And after that, there were, there were collections being put together before that. There were collections being put together by various ethnographers um, or anthropologist, I don't, don't let me split hairs on the, de defining the differences between those people. Um, but uh, they, uh, every, I think the Museum of Victoria had a collection of Aboriginal artworks. Uh, the South Australian Museum, of course, had a collection of Aboriginal art and artefacts, and same at, the same in Sydney and Brisbane. So those... Uh, that's the first phase, though. It wasn't seen, the Aboriginal objects and creations weren't really seen as art. And uh, although people collected those paintings and other objects, sculpture works, etc., they struggled to define them as art with a capital A. And so up until the time after the Second World War, uh, they, those collections were largely in ethnographic museums. In the 1950s, two things happened. Uh, the anthropologist couple, Ronald and Catherine Burnt, uh, put on an exhibition uh, of bark paintings from Arnhem Land where they named Aboriginal people individually for the first time. They named, it sounds peculiar, but it wasn't an unknown Aboriginal. This was, they were named Aboriginal people. They were named by their European name. They were named by their Aboriginal name. And they were named by their language name as well. Uh, and so they, they were divided into geographical styles. Uh, uh, and so they tried to, dis, to divide and really seriously look at uh, the paintings that were being done. The other thing that happened in the late 50s is the Art Gallery of New South Wales started to commission and collect uh, Tiwi poles, burial poles, from uh, Bathurst, uh, Melville Island, Melville Island, really, um, these burial poles that were put into the collection of the Art Gallery of New South Wales. Now, they, uh, that created a, a real stir at the time um, the, um, there was a long discussion about, is this the right place? Is this really art, or is this just uh, primitive art, or is it ethnography, not really art? And so that discussion went around again about what is it, this is art, is it not, not art, is it, or even if it is art, is it uh, minimalist, mim minimalist art, is it abstract art, and so on. And that discussion went around and around for a little while, and then it all dissipated, and the, the material, though, stayed in the Art Gallery of New South Wales. So Aboriginal art came to be shown in the, at that time, the major art gallery in Australia as art, albeit that was called the, in the primitive art gallery, as that mm -hmm. was placed with uh, New Guinea art, as, as some, a collection of New Guinea work, work from New Guinea that was also placed in that room. 
So that's the second phase, is that uh, recognition of Aboriginal artists as individuals. And a, a woman was actually in that burnt collection exhibition. There was a, a female painter in that collection. So that's a very big step uh, in that. Uh, the third, third phase, that all that art remained there. And when uh, the director who initiated that, the deputy director who initiated that left, um, the whole, it was there. No one wrote particularly about it. Uh, no, uh, the discussion died down again. Mm -hmm. And it was just there. Uh, it remained there. Um, the third phase is the 1970s phase of Western Desert uh, painters from the Western Desert taking designs of ground installation art that they did on the ground and on their bodies. And they uh, started to paint those images, those compositions, onto canvas using acrylic paint. And that's from the 1970s, early 1970s on. That debate then went around again. Is this real art? Is it tourist art? Is it just, um, is it, um, you know, cerebral art? Is it, is it something from a, a abstract thought? Is it, uh, is it just designs, patterns, or whatever? Um, and that went around for quite a long time, but by this stage, the Australian art world had moved on quite a bit in its appreciation of different styles of art. At that stage, in the Australian art world, the biggest argument that was going on that came to physical punches, you know, people would actually get really drunk at openings and have big punch-ups <laughs> over whether this paint, whether they were, uh, what was the correct art, the style of painting was whether it was abstract or whether it was figurative. And that was the hugest argument. That's the biggest argument that was going on in the white art world. Something really important, you know, uh, in the world. Uh, as against all the other things that were happening in the post-colonial things that were happening in Africa, there were wars going on, there was a war going on in China, uh, and so on. People, millions of people were being killed here and there all over the world. But the most important thing was we don't want to paint that or photograph it. We want to argue about whether I'm a figurative painter or I'm an abstract painter. Uh, they were the most important the ego things. So that's the third phase. The fourth phase is into the 80s, when post, really post-colonial writing and ideas start to come to Australia in a, in a very evident way. Because so by the 80s, in 1978, Edward Said had written um, Oriental, his Orientalist publication, Orientalism. And by the early 1980s, Omi Barber had written about uh, um, hybridity, uh, and so on, how we're all hybrid, really. So, and a number of exhibitions took place that recognised the Aboriginal people that weren't living in traditional communities, weren't practising traditional religion, um, and weren't even speaking their own language in that sense. These, these people had been to Western art schools. They'd then used... Western art styles, Western art materials, to s state their Aboriginality, their position, or their heritage, their legacy of uh, being of Aboriginal descent. So that was in the 1980s. Uh, by the end of the 1980s, these people uh, then began to form their own, their own uh, artist cooperatives, Bomali Aboriginal Artist Cooperative. Uh, to sell their work because they couldn't get into commercial galleries. C commercial galleries didn't take them up as the latest movement of Aboriginal art. Uh, so they set up their own arts cooperative and began to curate, uh, market and write about themselves um, in the early 80s. By the, uh, the fifth phase, in Aboriginal art is after that, 
when they formed that cooperative, they began to curate their own shows and write about themselves, albeit in a very minor way. But they, uh, they then began to write and control their representation as much as they could. So that is the fifth phase. And uh, we're now in what's called the sixth phase about there are Aboriginal artists curating and writing about ourselves, but um, there's a counter movement to again bring us back to back into the primitive, so to speak, into this reduced uh, thing. Uh, sorry, go on. Uh, <laughs> well, so I mean, that's actually helpful to lay out your, your vision of these stages because some of the things that we'll be talking about are you know, part of each of those things. Um, and I just want to go on and show you a next slide of Bula Bula because this did, um, you did it end up building a, a proper yes. um, uh, art center. And in fact, uh, this is a picture with me and Nana Booker in it in front of Bula Bula Arts. She's here tonight. But, um, but this picture was taken in 1983 of you with Wanjuk Marika. And um, you were down in Sydney at Australia Council. And we, we happened to look back through the Kluge Roo archives and we found an article that really speaks to what you were talking about because it was kind of a, one of those cusp moments between these two phases where there was an exhibition at the Art Gallery of New South Wales um, newly installed and they, the person who wrote the article said that previously uh, the bark paintings had been nailed to the walls and left there for 10 years. And, uh, and so you, that was the um, New Guinea and Aboriginal art that was kind of considered the primitive art. Mm. And this exhibition in 1983 was a, a new installation that was really returning to that idea that Tony Tuxon had of looking at the art as fine art. Mm. So I was just wondering if you wanted to reflect on that a little bit. Well, it's a, it's a period where I'd taken a break. Um, I, uh, um, I was very driven, so I d didn't actually... I used to stay there the whole year as much as I could in those places. In Ramangini. And, or, you know, another place, uh, Millingimbi in Ramangini. But this time, I took a break and I w actually was staying with someone and they said, oh, you should go and see the uh, exhibit, see the primitive art gallery at the Art Gallery of New South Wales and go and see uh, that exhibition. And so I did. And uh, I just asked at the door, uh, who is the Aboriginal art curator? here or who's looking after this collection and they said this woman uh, who was actually in charge of European, 18th century European art, she was actually in charge of that. But she took that up because she was trying to maintain or keep up Tony Tuxon, the deputy director who collected all this art, trying to keep his legacy alive and keep the Aboriginal art in the public domain and in the, in the public eye. Uh, um, and uh, she came down and talked to me and uh, she said, we've been trying to put on an exhibition of these baths from Millingimbi, Manangrita and Ramangini and so on. And I said, well, I actually live there. And so between us, we talked. Um, I had to go back to Ramangini but uh, we conversed, and, and in the end, there was an exhibition of, of these 200 bark paintings, of 200 of the 300-odd uh, bark paintings that were brought out and this huge exhibition that was put on uh, at that time. Now, the person behind me is a man called Wanjak Marika from Urukala, and it's a curious thing about, as I was saying, about this argument that was going on in the contemporary art world about whether I was an abstractionist or, and I wasn't smiling. He called me an abstractionist and I wasn't smiling. Um, he, um, that kind of thing, or whether I was a figurative painter. The people of um, Yurikala had uh, encountered a, a mining company coming to their area to mine, uh, who uh, reached an, an agreement with the Australian government to mine bauxite in their area. And in that process, 
really the Aboriginal people of that area. We heard Karen Wood give this talk here, and I was explaining to John Mongel that uh, this, she is the landowner here. This is the, we would say, you're the Wanga Watango, you're the landowner for this place. And this, these people in, in the Yurikala Peninsula, the Gove Peninsula, um, were, had reached this agreement without actually talking to the local Aboriginal people. And they uh, reacted by petitioning Parliament. You can make a petition to Parliament. And they uh, typed uh, a statement in two pages. And these were pasted on the back of two, uh, three small bark paintings that were sent off to Parliament and uh, to the National Parliament to say, look, we, we've lived here, we've always lived here, we, uh, we own this land or this land owns us. Uh, anything that's done here should be discussed with us before you do this, um, this mining. And uh, the government at the time uh, looked at it and they sort of cried crocodile tears and gasped and were profoundly moved by this, uh, this presentation, but uh, basically didn't do anything. Uh, they certainly weren't about to uh, acknowledge that the Aboriginal people owned this land. So they set up a commission of inquiry and that commission of inquiry essentially said that Aboriginal people uh, didn't really own this land. If anything, the land owned them, which is a nice sort of semantic twist uh, by some parliamentarian who was a poet. Um, um, the, uh, so that uh, commission was an impossible statement, an impossible thing for the government to stand on that. So they had another commission that that came forward, and as a result of that, uh, these people were given a form of, native, of land rights to that land. And the mining company then reached a form of contractual agreement that they would pay them money for, to, for mining on this land. Uh, they would, Aboriginal people would have control over the direction of that mining that their particularly sacred sites would be respected, uh, etc., to a certain degree. That all that is pragmatically, given the power inequality, that that was um, a real, really big, important movement. And people used these art pieces, these three bark paintings, as that statement. And Australians generally wouldn't think that they have great art pieces that say things, or in that time. Uh, they wouldn't have had said, we, we don't have a Guernica, or we don't have any of these great political statement paintings. And in fact, well, they did, these three paintings, that then uh, forced a change uh, in legislation that gave Aboriginal people certain rights. Uh, this was made into a film by Werner Herzog, this struggle called Where Green Ants Dream, mm. which is about this struggle. And the Wanjuk Marika, and, yeah, in actually, in as well. and, yeah. and Roy Marika. Well, that, I mean, Sorry. that's a great lead in to the next slide, which is the Aboriginal Memorial. Because, uh, again, the, the Yerkala Bark Petition, 1963, um, you know, really kicked off that very public land rights um, struggle, you know. And 1988, which was Australia's bicentennial, or the bicentennial of uh, the arrival, permanent settlement by the British in Australia, mm -hmm. uh, many Aboriginal people felt, you know, what's there to celebrate? And um, so this was the response that came out of Raman Ginnin with you very much uh, organizing and, um, you know, conceiving of it and implementing it. So can you describe what the Aboriginal Memorial is and how that happened? Well, it came out and sort of tied into the story of the Dreamings in another way. The, um, in 1988, as it came up, that was the 200 years of the coming of the British to colonize Australia and attempt to exterminate Aboriginal people. Um, 
It's sort of like what happened in the United States, I gather, with your 200 years of Columbus coming here, and a similar debate was taking place about, well, what were, was it really a great benefit that Columbus had came here? Was it really that important? Was it that important the British had come to Aboriginal Australia? So I'd um, actually, by the 1980s, Aboriginal art was appearing in major Australian institutions as a form of contemporary art, of, of the part of the art life of Australia uh, by the 1980s. So Aboriginal art had appeared in the Sydney Biennale at least three, four times um, by, the, uh, by 1988. Uh, it also appeared in some international exhibitions uh, albeit small exhibitions to uh, Southeast Asian countries and so on. Um, an Aboriginal, I think, an Aboriginal art exhibition had been to China by that stage too. So as it approached in uh, Aboriginal circles, it was debated about whether the coming of the British was anything to celebrate. And of course, we agreed that it wasn't. But how do you deal with this uh, event that's going to take place, that's going to take place, that's been sponsored by the Australian government to enormous amounts of money. They were building new buildings, they were building new roads. Every new road was called the Bicentenary Highway. Every new building was the Bicentenary, this or that. And there was going to be a Biennale of Sydney in uh, 1988, called the Under the Southern Sky, was going to be called. Um, and all these artists were making 200 of this, 200 of that, 200. They were making portraits of 200 famous women, 200 famous colonial bakers, you know, whatever, 200 meat pies, uh, and so on. Uh, literally, uh, some of the 200 went to that length uh, of absurdity. And we had an Australian uh, who was having his 200th schooner of beer, uh, Prime Minister, uh, who was very famous for drinking, um, and yeah, he was most probably going to have his 200th, 200th schooner of beer. Um, so that was what was going on. So we decided, I went to a number of meetings in Sydney. I lived in Ramanginning, but I was going back and forth uh, put, to put on commercial exhibitions in Sydney and Melbourne and other places. And I went to a number of meetings of Aboriginal people in Sydney about what we were going to do. What, how could we make an impact that would draw attention to everything? Um, and uh, the, um, m the director of the Biennale uh, told, uh, I was told to go and meet him. And I went and met him. And I'd had this idea of a forest of burial poles for many years. And uh, 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 as a way to display these poles was to show them um, like in a forest, to make, put up a, two forms of curating, of presenting things. You either put up a critical mass, some things operate more effectively as a critical mass, a number of objects rather than just one. Or the opposite of that is, is the solitary uh, iconic object where the object, there's this one object that's put up with extreme reverence mm -hmm. as a, almost like a holy object, uh, the iconic object, or this critical mass approach. And with the critical mass approach is to find out, well, what numbers uh, will make this critical mass? And of course, with the bicentenary, it was 200, 200 years, 200 burial poles. And he took to it uh, straight away as an idea. And uh, uh, the idea is that the British coming, and other people, but the British mainly, coming to Australia was 200 years of dispossession, disempowerment, disbursement, and uh, basically mur murder and, and an attempt at annihilation on a large scale. And that at the scale of that annihilation attempt every year is becoming more and more apparent as more and more research is done 
about how many people were really killed. And the latest figure is that there was, in Queensland alone, there was 60,000 Aboriginal people killed since the coming of the British. Uh, that was more than all the Australian casualties in the First World War. Now, that was in Queensland, the state of Queensland alone. So there are six states in Australia. So that, that if you multiply that by six, um, that's uh, you know, 300,000 at least. And it's, I would say it's much bigger than that. So this statement, I decided people were boycotting be, to having anything to do with the Biennale of Sydney to do with the bicentenary. And I decided that absence would not be noticed if we weren't going to be in any of the things to do with the, the bicentenary celebrations, that some people wouldn't even notice it. Most people, I thought, just would not even notice it. They would say, oh, the Aborigines, aren't. no one's going to go like, oh, we're the Aborigines. Uh, really, they just, uh, they're going to have these grand balls and these grand feasts. Uh, dance parties, and basically that's literally what the celebration of the coming of the British ended up. A, uh, there was no specific, specific legislation that gave certain dispossessed or disadvantaged people more power. Uh, they didn't increase any of the rights of women, particularly. They didn't uh, give more money to the poor, we didn't fix up the health system or hospitals or anything particularly. It was just basically an endless period of parties and parties and parties. And my memory is that that's when we started to drink champagne, yeah. uh, more so than beer. Um, instead of shouting six beers, we'd get a bottle of Moet Chandon <coughs> instead. Uh, we discovered what champagne was. So, Go sorry, on. just want to um, <laughs> point out, because I've moved on to the slide of uh, the installation at the National Gallery, what the early installation. So this, this was acquired after the Biennale by the National Gallery and on permanent exhibition there for, you know, well, more or less. Well, it was, it was a, then. this, I believe, curating is, a, is all curating and all art really is about a conversation. And uh, don't worry, I'll shut up in a minute. But you will get a break. So we're having a uh, but uh, the uh, not you. But um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just uh, before these people go to sleep. Um, but um, uh, all art, I think, all art and all, of all forms is a, is a conversation. It's to stimulate conversation. It's to stimulate people to come together and talk to each other. And the thing about Aboriginal society is the greatest uh, greatest art that we create is the art of living together. That is the greatest art you can ever create or carry or practice. So you think of Aboriginal people living in Australia for 70,000 years. Uh, we didn't build skyscrapers. We didn't have a mass Mustang to drive um, or whatever. We weren't drinking malt Chandon. But why we existed on that planet, on that continent, without anything, any of those accoutrements of Europe or China or whatever, that we learned how to survive with each other. We had social practices that allowed us to exist together, to settle disputes, and to actually enjoy life, to create life. And part of that was the art creation came into being, creation of art came into being through a group of related people coming together to create art in all forms, singing, dancing, painting, etc., uh, across all art forms, across all ages and genders, would all come together to create an art event, an art practice, it's a practice of creating art. Now, the reason of that coming together, the point of all that creation of art, which was very ephemeral and would be destroyed in the process of the, the, the performance that took place, 
uh, it would only exist in the memories of people, uh, the so memories of those songs. The real reason why you came together was to affirm your relationships to each other, to affirm the relationships to each other, to reaffirm your relationships and responsibilities to the society you lived in, to reaffirm and uh, reinforce the relationships and responsibilities you had to the environment, the land and the environment, and to reinforce and uh, reaffirm your responsibilities to the spiritual cosmos. And that's what that art, that's how real art, I think, is made. And so all these art works we're just looking at, especially the Aboriginal Memorial, which John Mountjoy has a number of poles in, is uh, it's about a group of people coming together around an idea uh, to, uh, uh, to reaffirm their relationships to each other and to the society they live in, the Australian society they live in, and... Um, and to make this political statement about this is what the coming of the British to, to Australia, in effect, met, meant. Now, in fact, there were a number of, smaller number of Aboriginal memorials across the continent, here and there, uh, not many that existed. But uh, I collaborated with um, these artists, I had this idea, I took it to these artists, I had endless conversations and discussions about why we were making this thing. I would say a lot of these people still didn't understand completely. Uh, there is a belief, though, that in Arnhem Land there was a false belief that people there existed and were able to exist without a fight, without being threatened with kill, being killed. Now, in fact, in near Ramangini, uh, there was a cattle war. The people had come there to set up a cattle station, a ranch, that you might call, and Aboriginal people were killing the cattle and stealing wire and other things. And uh, the person who was setting up that, um, that cattle ranch uh, they got together a group of uh, men, all the workers, and they rode around and attempted a number of times to exterminate all the Aboriginal people in that area. There's a number of clan groups that exist in Remingenin today that only exist as one family, and a lot of that is to do with they cop the brunt of that attack uh, that attempt to annihilate all the Aboriginal people in that area so that the cattle could roam free, uh, as you've seen in Oklahoma and whatever. Yeah. Um, but so that's, that became... I, I collaborated with these people, the artist. I also collaborated with Wally Karawana at the Art National Gallery and James Mollison, the director. We took this to James Mollison to say, look, this is what we'd like to do. I would like to do this for the bicentenary. And he said that, well, this is incredible. I will support this. I will give you the money to create this. In fact, he said he tried to say, look, I'll give you half the money before you leave the building today. Um, <laughs> which is someone who wanted this to happen and wanted action to make it happen. So it was commissioned by them. They would then own it, but we ag he agreed that the gallery would have this on permanent display mm. when it got there. And it's been in different places in the National Gallery, and... Um well, it's been to oh, Switzerland, is, too. It's, it's been to, to and Germany to, and the, to the Hermitage, Hermitage. in, in um, uh, St. Petersburg. Really only travelled that one time on yes, that extended yeah. tour. But yeah. then they built this purpose-built space for it and mm -hmm. just recently celebrated the 30th anniversary as well. Yes, that's right. So, um, so at the same time as the Aboriginal Memorial, the 
1988, the bicentennial year, was that was the year of the Dreamings exhibition. So um, That's right. yes. since, since this is our organizing you know, idea for the symposium, wanted to just talk about your role with the Dreamings exhibition. Well, in this case of two, uh, there were two exhibitions that were attempted to, to uh, come together in this way. Uh, because taking Aboriginal art, uh, if uh, supporters of Aboriginal art within Australia, lovers of Aboriginal art, wanted to take these things overseas, they, for two, a number of reasons. One was the, just the beauty of the art and the, and, uh, the aesthetics. If you l love that art, you would want the world to see it and understand it. The other reason, of course, is the po political statement of bringing Aboriginal people into the light so they would then be more politically... Certain people would be more politically responsible towards Aboriginal people. So I knew um, Peter Sutton, uh, sorry, who's over there, uh, who's with us today, and Chris Anderson, who's with us today, uh, for quite well, in fact, um, through a number of other exhibitions that were carried out in Adelaide. But they'd also really worked uh, with art exhibitions and studies. They created lots of exhibitions that were about particular Aboriginal art practices uh, to bring that into the light, to make this thing, to this ingenuity and intelligence and imagination that Aboriginal people it displayed in these creations into the light. So rather than people saying Aboriginal people are Stone Age people or unintelligent um, and in this really racist way, uh, that they've published a number of exhibitions and catalogues before this time, or just about this time. The 1980s was a very fertile time for uh, all forms of Aboriginal creativity, um, and certainly at the South Australian Museum. So they put up this proposal through a way that they'll explain tomorrow, I think, about how it actually happened this proposal to take an exhibition to New York to the Asia Society Gallery. And uh, they put together a selection of work, and we were, Rem and Guinea was very fortunate in having a couple of, uh, of senior Aboriginal artists in that selection of work. Uh, so they, uh, uh, I don't say they, Peter um, Sutton arrived one day with Andrew Pekarek who was the curator of the Asia Society Gallery, to meet uh, the Aboriginal artist and, um, and have this conversation and make the invitation, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that, that discussion took place with every other artist in the work. They were very um, diligent in talking to the artists they wanted to put in the show. Uh, and how it was going to be displayed, the reason behind these particular works. So it was a very intense uh, con um, conversation that took place with the Aboriginal artists in these remote areas. Um, and then, as it turned out, they then uh, wanted the artists to come to the exhibition opening. The other, there's three rules. My I have three rules to do with curating <laughs> Aboriginal uh, art. And one is that you have to bring the artist to the exhibition. You'll see lots of exhibitions, in fact, where the artist isn't present. And I think curators have always got to remember that they aren't the star. Um, uh, they, are, they didn't make the art. Uh, these, this other poor bugger did, uh, called an artist. Uh, the starving artist. Um, yeah. uh, we were pretty cool then. Yeah. Uh, um, so they, um, that's one thing, to bring the artist. The second rule is that you have to pay the artist a fee for using their work in the exhibition. And the third thing is 
that you have to publish a catalogue that remains behind after the exhibition comes down. And this, this is what this group, the uh, group of largely anthropologists at the South Australian Museum, they were putting this together and they created a, um, a really magnificent catalogue. They brought the artist, arranged to find a sponsor so that they could bring us to New York, uh, Dolly Granitz and these other people from Ewan Demu uh, also came um, and we were paid mm -hmm. to come. And there's another story there which I won't bore you with. Anyway, not about the payment, but uh, we were given a check, uh, a reserve, what we call the reserve bank check. Uh, and before we went to go back, we were looked after and paid money to eat and drink and be merry, etc., smoke uh, and buy clothes, etc. And then when we were finished with the exhibition open, this really grand opening, lots of people came to it, including John Clue, who saw the show. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's why we're here now. He then became enamoured with Aboriginal art and wanted to start to collect it. He said, oh, this is the, the art practice of the, of the time to, to collect this. But uh, when we were then given our checks, all right, this is your pay, and we went back. We arrived back in Sydney, and it's a reserve bank check. So there is a reserve bank in the middle of Sydney. And so we went to the Reserve Bank and said, can we cash this cheque? Uh, this is us. And we all had passports. So we were able to show this is us, this is who we are. And the guy behind the counter kept saying, we don't know who you are. And uh, we're saying, well, this is our passport. This is us. Like, see the photo? Look, this is us. Yeah. yeah. And they said, oh, but you could have stolen those. And um, I said, yeah, that's right. We could have steamed the photo off and went through that, you know, like that. We're, we're like Russian spies. We could, sw <laughs> we could falsify these passports and whatever. And then I said, well, it's got the signature. And they said, um, that mightn't be the Reserve Bank signature. Mm -hmm. And it went on like that until I could have punched these people. <laughs> so... Um, we then left uh, that place and I went to the Art Gallery of New South Wales where people knew me and said, look, we're having this trouble. And they said, look, just give us a minute. You sit down and we'll get some cut tea and coffee and biscuits and cakes and they brought out this feast for us. And then he said, look, uh, go down to our bank. Uh, just to, I've told them who you are. Just show them who you are and they'll give you the money in cash. And that resolved that uh, mm. thing. And that wasn't uh, particularly the museum's problem. You would think that people would have been a bit more open to actually paying mm. their own checks. Mm. So this is us That's buying it. clothes. And, this uh, is us. <laughs> talking at the symposium. Yes, talking at the symposium. It really wasn't... We were really embarrassed because... It's the first time we'd been to the United States. Uh, we'd come across the Pacific. Uh, we really suffered from jet lag uh, and struggled to get through this talking thing that we were supposed to be there and be happy and, and, uh, and really full of knowledge and whatever and quoting algorithms and whatever um, and family charts. So, but we really struggled with this. And uh, one day I think we should make a film. I want to make a short film about this trip because it turned out in the end there was uh, Chris and Peter and uh, Fred Myers and Francois de Sart and there was myself. I was the art advisor and the art advisor from Ewan Demu was there. And so there was an, art, an anthropologist. There's that joke about an Aboriginal family as a man, a woman and a child and and an anthropologist. Uh, <laughs> and now in the 80s, the joke is, of course, the, the, uh, the modern Aboriginal family is a man, woman, and child, and a photographer. Um, but that was what it was like. Every artist virtually had their own anthropologist. <laughs> but the beauty of that was 
that these anthropologists and myself, we could actually converse in language with each artist. So there were five languages or something being spoken. So it was just this, the scene was so funny, like we just say, all right, we're going to go for breakfast and where do you want to go? And so everyone had to speak. There'd be five conversations going on, what do you want to eat sort of thing. And of course, these people from Ram and Guinea will say, well, we don't know. We've never been to New York before. Uh, we don't even know what, you, what food there is here. We don't know what food is. But this intense conversations would suddenly take place. It was just uh, like a, com a Monty Python sketch is what it was. <laughs> but it was a, a great time to be there. Uh, it made the press everywhere. Um, People like Thomas Keneally wrote an article, a huge article uh, for it, and other people wrote articles and reported on it. Uh, and um, serious art writers started to take, take it up. Uh, John we the John Weber Gallery started to sell um, uh, the Western Desert paintings, mm -hmm. and John Kluge started this collection. He did, in fact. Um, mm. uh, okay, so this is this is just a funny photo, but um, Thank you. I love it because John's carrying a rifle there, and he has a story about John Kluge coming to Ramen Guinea. Um, so John Kluge had a home in um, New York, and he went to the Dreamings exhibition, and really, within about a month, he uh, flew over to Australia on his private jet, and flew to Ramen Guinea. Mm. Uh, so he he arrived in Ramen Guinea. Well, he actually went to a number of other places yes. too. Yes, uh, but, he, but yeah. when he arrived in Ramen Guinea to meet with you, yes. can, can you just describe? Well, what, the thing was, he he happened. was coming. We were trying to work out who this person was, and we uh, we don't normally meet billionaires. That's the first person I'd met that was a billionaire. Of course, it's like you know fifty cents nowadays, uh, but uh, people talk about billions all the time. But it's the first time I'd heard someone described as a billionaire. And in his uh, talk, I, had, I met Maurice Tuckman, who was his uh, curatorial advisor at that stage. And I remember he asked me in New York, do you think we, he'll need a bodyguard? When he said, well, he need bodyguard. And I thought, like, bodyguard? What do we, you know, it's <laughs> this village of about 300 people. Like, we hardly wore clothes, what anything, you know. Um, I don't know what he was frightened of, and it just said, no, he won't need a bodyguard. Um, but then they were coming on this certain day. So I cleaned the house, you know, as I say, scrubbed the toilet bowl, did all these things, washed up, cleaned the house, um, and cleaned the car, my truck. And I took everything out of the truck and hosed it down, scrubbed it down so it was shiny and new. And uh, I was putting everything back into the car, and they'd arrived early. And some teacher had went out and picked them up from the airport. They flew in, and they just arrived suddenly. And as I was putting this, the, the, the jack and the spare tire and that back into the truck, and I had this, um, they were looking at me because I was, you know, I was sort of half undressed or wearing no shirt and whatever. And uh, they were giving me this really funny look, as, and they got off the truck really cautiously he and his wife, and uh, they were looking at me, and then I realised I was carrying the shotgun <laughs> with me. <laughs> um, but things went on really well uh, after that. Uh, and so it looked like some sort of hillbilly or something. But then things went on really well, because the people there, Remingen is a place where children would just come up and say, well, who are you, and what's your name? And, they, without offence, they're just saying, oh, yeah, my, you know, I'm so-and-so, what, what's your name? And I remember one period where John Clude was walking through the street and there, all these kids were coming up and saying, well, who, what's your name, what's your name? And he was telling them, you know, and having this conversation. And that's the kind of community it was. You could just wander around and he didn't need a bodyguard, obviously. Um, but uh, he'd came there and he came at a bad time uh, in, the, in that there, there was a, it was a very busy year and I'd just come back from somewhere else for another exhibition 
and there was absolutely nothing in the arts centre. And uh, these, uh, Morris Tuckman and uh, Mike O'Farrell was this Australian curator. They were running around trying to say, look, look at this, look at this. Uh, yeah, it's not a waste of time. You know, this is uh, not a waste of time. And then I looked over and we, we lived in, the, uh, we operated out of that shipping container and uh, we had to have a, a rock to step up into it. And we used to have flower drums, these drums, metal five-gallon drums, and we'd put a cushion on it, and that was our seats, uh, because we were operating at a very high level, of course. Um, it was a very sophisticated place. But I remember looking over, and John Klug was sitting on this flower drum, and sort of just really uh, bored, basically. and. And he looked and he said, yeah, well, he said, well, what do you reckon, John? And uh, then I said, look, uh, well, I had this uh, proposal to give a collection of paintings, a commission collection of paintings to new Parliament House. In 1988, the Australian government had built this incredible new Parliament House. It's that Parliament House we use today. And they were looking for art objects to go into that and I'd uh, put this proposal forward to them that in uh, Remingeni, in that part of the world, there was a binary, uh, the society existed in this binary form. There was this half, they call it the moiety system. Moiety is a French word. What does that mean? Half. Yeah, thank you. Uh, <laughs> how do you pronounce that? Moiety, yes. Um, so they um, existed in other, in other parts of the country, in the southeast as well. People existed in this thing that was like a yin and yang. Everyone knows about yin and yang, but they don't understand uh, that Aboriginal societies, in large part, operate on this binary system. And the two, the Parliament House exists on a binary system. There are two Houses of Parliament. You have two Houses of Parliament here, don't you? Or yeah. Congress, uh, or three or four or something like that. Well, anyway, it doesn't matter here. You just chuck that out the window <laughs> when you want. Oh, so anyway, they had two Houses of Parliament. It's called a bicameral system of parliamentary de democracy. And so uh, these two Houses have to agree, or they just debate things, and in Australia, there's a two-party system, uh, like you have your major parties here. There are about 100 other minor political parties, but you have the Republicans and the, the Democrats. In Australia, they're the Liberal Country Party and the Labor Party. And the, the debate that they have in Parliament brings laws together and creates the life that we have to live, that we live under. And so the idea was to put a collection of these two halves of paintings. Uh, one would be Dua. This Dua is one half, the yin part, so to speak, the sunrise people. And the other half, Yiricha paintings and objects. The, all these Dua paintings and objects would be put in the government offices and all these other ones would be put in the opposition offices. Now, they didn't, uh, they ran out of money, the Parliament Committee ran out of money, and so that didn't happen. So, but when John Kluge uh, said, well, what, it, what do you think? And I said, well, look, there's a commission. You could have this commission. It's not going to go into Parliament, but it can go into, um, well, you could have that. And, and he went, oh, yeah, no, it's, yeah, he's really interested, and he said, uh, and I said, but it's, it costs you hundreds of thousands of dollars and that. And he looked at his wife and he said, oh, no, we'd, we'd love one of those. <laughs> and we'll have one of those. And that was how it went. I th uh, I th and I think that you've told me, um, and maybe you've written this as well, that there's also a little bit of natural competition that exists between the moieties. And people, when they brought in their artworks into the art center and, and displayed them, like this work by Andrew Margalulu, other people would see that and they'd think, oh, well, 
Mm. I can, you know, I can I do, do my that. biggest yeah. best painting and bring that one in. And so the quality of the paintings that were produced for this commission were really quite extraordinary. And yes, yeah, so really I think it's the thing about general patronage of anything. Uh, all great artists in history have had a patron, you know, any music or anything, paintings or whatever you can think of, or plays or whatever, they've been under a patronage of somebody. When artists believe that they can do anything and work to any scale, mm. they will, if they uh, know that they will be commiserate, um, they'll be recompensed with by financially, and they can just practice and expect to be um, to be uh, to have a living, and so th that's what this commission did. Mm -hmm. So these artists, when uh, they, they made larger paintings, uh, they'd made larger paintings before, but they really made these beautiful paintings. Uh, this uh, painting by Mickey Durham um, is really a body painting for a particular ceremony, but this is the first time I've ever seen this on a flat surface, like a, a flat painting surface. And that happened as a result of this commission. Uh, so different innovations and um, different expressions came out of that. I want to move on just a little bit because we're getting close to time. And um, this, this is also just a picture of us all working at Morvan, John Kluge's property on the catalog that came out of um, his collection, Art from the Land. And John speaking at a symposium we had in 1997, shortly before the collection was given to UVA. Um, and then um, we have talked just a, about a couple of other exhibitions that have been abroad um, from Australia. Native Born was shown in Australia, but then also came back to the Asia Society Galleries mm -hmm. much later. Yeah. Um, and Arajara. Um, was another mm -hmm. one, and I just mm -hmm. want, wondered if you wanted to share a couple of thoughts very briefly about yes. um, the difference between Dreamings and Arajara, or... Um... Well, a number of, as the bicentenary came up, as I said, there were people um, who were supporters of Aboriginal art. There, quite, there were a number of people who thought they should put large exhibitions together for that bicentenary and tour them overseas. Um, uh, the South Australian Museum and that team of people got their act together much quicker and more, and I think they were more focused on what they were actually doing in one way. Um, two Aboriginal people were in charge of the Aboriginal Arts Board, Gary Foley, was the director, an act, political activist, they both were, and Charles Chicka Dixon was the chairman. Now, they made a sort of a very strong statement in the lead up to 1988. They basically told the Australia Council that they, their Aboriginal Arts Board would not fund uh, any bicentenary projects. And they said, our strategy is to take our um, take Aboriginal art overseas, to put exhibitions together and take it overseas. Of course, they were taken out and shot the next day, of course, but uh, so to speak, they were sacked uh, and uh, that uh, revolt of sorts didn't go anywhere. But they involved a German, Swiss German artist called Bernard Luthi, who was in Australia at the time, and he went back to Germany to, um, which is where he lived, he went back to Germany to take this message and try to find people who would be interested in taking an Aboriginal art exhibition overseas uh, to speak about our side of the history of the British coming to Australia. Uh, they couldn't get that anything to happen in 89, or 88, 89, but in 1989 there was a bicentenary, another bicentenary exhibition happened called The Magicians of the Earth at the Pompidou Centre. Now that exhibition 
Um, had a lot of Aboriginal artists in it. In fact, uh, John Mulinger, I think, was in that too, I think. Yeah, in The Magicians of the Earth. And so it was uh, the two men. Uh, uh, Jimmy Woolaloo from the Dreamings exhibition was also in that Magicians of the Earth exhibition. So Bernard Luthi took, organised to take a group of artists from Ewan de Moo and they installed a, a sand painting, as it's called, um, in that, in, as part of the Magicians of the Earth exhibition. While he was there, he met a lot of other art curators of like mind who said, we would love to have an Aboriginal art exhibition. So he went back to Dusseldorf and they negotiated with a number of other curators in institutions in Europe. And eventually, though, the crux of it, the real story, was he went to school with a... There was a guy he went to school with who now worked in a German bank in Dusseldorf. And they had lunch one day and that man said, we will fund mm. Arajara to happen. And they virtually gave nearly two million Deutschmarks, which was quite a large sum of money in those days. The Deutschmark was a really solid currency. And uh, they, he supported the, to the tune of, I think it's 1.8 million Deutschmarks they put up. They uh, were able to convince the Kunstsammlung North Rhine-Westfalen in Dusseldorf, the art collection in Dusseldorf, to take the exhibition. They convinced the Hayward Gallery in London to take the exhibition and they convinced the Louisiana Museum in Denmark uh, to take the exhibition. Now, those three uh, are very contemporary art spaces. Uh, I know we won't get into debating about contemporary and modern and what other things. We can save that for save tomorrow. Save that for tomorrow. <laughs> but they're, they're very contemporary art spaces. They were only, they were only built in the 1960s. And they were very cutting edge. Like Joseph Boyce used to teach in Dusseldorf at the art school. Uh, Penck, that uh, German uh, figurative painter, he used to paint, teach at the art school. And the Haywood Gallery, of course, was the place of contemporary art in London. And the Humlebeck, the, the Louisiana Museum, is, I think, the greatest contemporary art space I've ever been in really, as an art museum. So they were all very contemporary art places. So we were able to score that, and that money then allowed that to happen. Now, by a fate, thing of fate or bad luck or a curse, uh, I was also involved in giving advice. I d I, my uh, advice was more almost companionship to these people at the South Australian Museum, who knew what they were doing and that they were operating at a level commiserate with what I would do, uh, but they did all that themselves. Uh, with Arajara, I also gave support to that. Now, there's a point that's written somewhere, uh, I read it the other day, that the um, Dreamings exhibition was, had oh, this incredible range of art and uh, from historical objects through to really contemporary produced art pieces. And people also created a ground painting in that, as part of that. But it didn't include uh, this group of people, the Bamali group. They, uh, they as I was saying, that uh, fourth phase of Aboriginal art, when people in urban settings started to make art, and they came together to form this cooperative um, called Bamali Aboriginal Artists uh, because to, to curate their own shows in their own space. So they didn't have to depend on it, trying to convince institutions you have to take this or that. They could just do this themselves. And they were the backbone of people starting to write about themselves and curate their own exhibitions. So, but because they only came into being in 1987, they missed being in the 1988 Biennale of Sydney. 
they hadn't had their act together to get into that. They also missed being in the French uh, magicians of the earth. They could have easily have fitted into that. And they missed into the dreaming. Uh, the reason why they were in Arajara is that that took place, what, five years after 1988. 1994 was when Arajara started. Mm -hmm. But they were able to get in on the Aboriginal advisory p panel that was going to drive Arajara. And that's really how they got into, into Arajara. Otherwise, they wouldn't have got into Arajara either. So um, we only have a couple more minutes. And there's one project that you've done that I really would like you to talk about. But I did want to slide this image in just because um, this is taken Oops. by uh, Michael Riley, one of the members of Bumali. And that's a famous image of John. Um, but this is the project that I'd like you to talk about. And we'll just wrap up with this, because I, I, I love this project. We discussed it at length. Um, and this is something that you did with a, a community, really a group of descendants of the people in this photograph. Um, and what you see on the right is a, is a painting that was made. So could you just describe a little bit of that and kind of your art practice, which is kind of a, a combination of, of curatorial and art practice, um, working mm. with groups of people? Well, I do think that, that as a curator, uh, there's a um, of their names will come to me. There's two Swiss curators who redefined what a curator was. One, once upon a time, there were curators who organized artists, and there were artists who made art, and then there were curators who organized artists into exhibitions, etc. But these people saw themselves as curators, but they saw themselves as being like the fifth artist, the the additional artist to make that exhibition, to make that project happen. Now, again, I fell into this by accident. I can draw and I can read and write and do those things, and I can draw really well, in fact, uh, but I don't call myself an artist. Uh, as I say, I, my 4A statement is I don't call myself an artist, and I don't call myself an anthropologist, I don't call myself an academic, uh, but I am an Aboriginal person, and therefore I know something at least of note. So this, is, this place is, came out of a project. I used to use this photo on the left to show people that in colonial times, before Aboriginal people got the vote, before Aboriginal people had the power to own property, before land rights was recognised, before Aboriginal people were really recognised, we didn't just sit around drinking and, and taking drugs and, and, um, and being mentally depressive. People actually strived to enjoy life. And they formed, they uh, formed, uh, oh, sorry. anyway, well. formed uh, this band. Uh, they formed a band like that. And they used to make their own instruments. They used to actually make violins and uh, guitars and so on. And they would play at, on res at what you would call reservations. They would go and play. And they'd hold dances out under the night sky in the open uh, for that local group. Now, that band came from a place called Purfleet. And Purfleet is has a reputation for being the, one of the most terribly depressed communities um, in Australia, one of the most. And uh, I came there, and I had this photo, and I just said, look, I've got this photo here. Uh, they said, we want you to do an, an art project. And I said, well, I'm not an artist. And then they said, no, no, we really want you to do it. So I came there, and I had the photo, and I said to them, are all these families, are they still here? That photograph was taken in 1909. And I said, are there any of these families here? And they said, yeah, all these families are still here. Uh, they're, you know, they're big, they're in big numbers. So I went around and started to talk to people and said, this is what I want to do. I want to turn this black and white photo into a pointerless type painting. 
And uh, I said, all I want you to do is come and finger paint this painting. And some people were saying, oh, well, that's terrible. That's like kids' stuff and this whatever. And I said, no, but what it means is none of these people might think of themselves as artists. In fact, they might be not be artists or painters. They might be very old people who have never painted. They might be kids who have never painted. But they can put their fingerprints and their DNA into this painting. So the schools next to me, the, this gallery, then brought their kids in. There were the, these, these kids were um, teenagers. They were the high school kids and then primary school kids. In all, 38 members of the local community that were direct descendants of this group came in. And we would give them a cup of tea and talk to them. And then they'd talk about, well, that's my grandfather there, or that's my grandmother. And we asked them to sign a book. They'd sign a visitor's book and say who they were. But it was one of the most beautiful projects I've ever done. And I'd, I, it's, it's in a very tiny, insignificant place in many ways. Perfleet, no one talks about Perfleet. No one certainly doesn't do any art about Perfleet. And uh, it just turned out to this, be this incredible painting and they then, the gallery then said, well, look, that's your painting. And I said, no, no, I'll donate that to the gallery. So the gallery has colonial paintings of that district. They have Aboriginal people in colonial paintings of that district. And I said, well, you now have this Aboriginal painting of the Aboriginal people of this district in very contemporary terms. And uh, it's now in their collection and they displayed it during National Aboriginals Week in 2009, 200, 100 years after that photograph was taken. I have one more painting. So um, there you are with the yeah. final painting. OK, so we are at the end of our time. And we'll as, you, time. as you know, uh, we could go on for another hour. And we, we had more to show you as well. Um, thankfully, John will be speaking again tomorrow tomorrow afternoon uh -huh. um, and on, on a panel. And we can just please hold your questions for that time, because we actually have to evacuate this room in about five minutes. So I just ask for you, your cooperation with that. But um, for me, it is such a joy to listen to John talk, his wealth of knowledge, the way that he has really eschewed personal recognition to work with groups of people and bring them together in collaborative um, art expressions and things that really draw attention to indigenous people globally. Um, he's really made such a difference in the world of Aboriginal art over the past 40 years. And it's such a privilege to have him here with us and to learn from him tonight. So please help me thank John Mendel.